We've had some last minute questions that the sister has answered in terms of inquiry. And now we come back to Brahman. The sister continued. Brahman considers itself as the infinite space because Brahman is infinite consciousness. Infinite space is in direct correlation to infinite consciousness. Space is what allows things to exist. If there were no space, which there ultimately isn't, but let's ignore that for the moment, if there was no space, then there wouldn't be anything. In the same way, Brahman, which is infinite consciousness or infinite awareness, is aware of all the things which arise in space. Without awareness, we couldn't say that there's anything. In fact, without awareness, there wouldn't be anything. The infinite space itself is the cosmic person in whom the world exists. This is Brahma, the creator. As soon as you've got space, with things in it. Well, this is the cosmic person which gives rise to all of creation. This is our set of fundamental notions. But all this is non different from Brahman, and hence all this is Brahman. You could say that space, which in itself is nothing, is a manifestation of Brahman. This world appearance is otherwise an illusion, though it is seen as a reality, even as water in the mirage is unreal and illusory, though it seems to exist. So we've heard this before, but there's a few other things I would like to add to this at some point. But let's see what Rama asked next. Pray tell me, when does Brahman not consider itself thus? In other words, when does Brahman not consider itself as infinite space. Vasishta said, in Brahman, the infinite consciousness, the image of creation exists even now. However, though it is true that creation and non-creation exist in Brahman everywhere at all times, they do not exist independently of him or it. And hence, from another point of view, they do not exist. Since this creation is, like movement and wind, non-different from Brahman, Brahman does not know it as an object. Therefore, creation is without beginning and without end, and that is Brahman. And this is enlightenment practice. There's a coming and going all the time. Coming and going between creation and non-creation. Coming and going between remembering and forgetting. When you are not enlightened and when you experience an awakening, by merely listening to these words, you experience an apparent duality or diversity in what is in fact non-dual Brahman. So, what I just said about enlightenment practice actually presupposes a duality. But we have to come back to the realization that there is only Brahman there isn't actually any remembering or forgetting. There is only Brahman. Nothing exists here and therefore there are no concepts of objects. There is nothing other than the self and the self does not conceive of an object. What appears to be the three worlds appears to be at all times, but it is a supremely peaceful Brahman in which there is no diversity at all. It is only as long as you are not fully enlightened that you experience apparent diversity. So the extent to which you are engaged in enlightenment practice is the extent to which this is not really full enlightenment. When you are fully enlightened, you will need neither scriptures nor instructions, and you will not experience duality or diversity based on the notion of I. I would like to actually 
look into this a bit further. Our reality is actually based on sensation. A while back, I made a little bit of fun of the sort of person who would say, look, this is solid, this is real. Well, in a way, this is true, this is correct. But as long as we're in touch with what's being experienced there and not with our idea of experience, Notionally, I am tapping a book. Experientially, there's resistance going on. The fundamental reality is actually associated with the sense of touch. For some reason, this is not being explored. You see, babies, when they're, when they're giving a new object, they want to grab it and chew it, put it in their mouth, make it, this is what makes it real for them, taste and touch. The sense of sight can come and go. We can cover up our ears. We can never really get rid of noise, but we can to a large extent. We can hold our noses cover our mouths, but we're always going to have a sense of touch. This is our fundamental reality, is sensation. And that sensation is one of resistance. It's sometimes said that we live in a space-time continuum, but the reality of the space-time continuum is a resistance motion continuum. So the sense of touch is really about resistance, just as space has three dimensions. We could perhaps say that touch has three dimensions. There is this dimension of resistance, but there's also texture, and there's also heat or coldness. I think that covers it. Perhaps there's other dimensions to touch. So that's resistance. These are the qualities of resistance. That's what we experience through touch. And on that, we actually base our belief in the physical world.